Rated X. Welcome to the Launchpad Podcast. Motherfucker! Welcome to the Launchpad. Today, on this album review podcast, we will be reviewing Nine Inch Nails' debut album, Pretty Hate Machine. So I'm going to get into some notes on the start of the band, how the album came about. the end, I'm going to review track by track, just a few thoughts on the songs, and then wrap it up into a full album review at the end. Michael Trent Reznor was born on May 17th, 1965. Reznor was raised in Mercer, Pennsylvania, which is about a half hour from where I live. At the age of six, his parents divorced and he was passed off to live with his grandparents. Reznor began playing piano at the age of 12 and showed an early aptitude for music. His grandfather told People Magazine that music was Trent's life from the time he was a boy. His former piano teacher said that he always reminded her of Harry Connick Jr. Reznor told Rolling Stone Magazine in 1994 that his sheltered life in Pennsylvania left him feeling isolated from the outside world, but he did not want to give the impression that it was a miserable childhood. Trent learned how to play tenor saxophone and tuba and was a member of the jazz band. Reznor also became involved in theater while in high school and was voted best in drama by his classmates for his role as Judas in Jesus Christ Superstar. He graduated in 1983 and attended Allegheny College, where he studied computer engineering. After a year of college, Reznor dropped out and moved to Cleveland, Ohio, to pursue a career in music. His first band in Cleveland was a cover band called The Urge. Soon after, he joined a local band called The Exotic Birds, and he even appeared with them in a Michael J. Fox movie called The Light of Day. During this time, Reznor got a job at Cleveland's Right Track Studio as an assistant engineer and janitor. Studio owner Bart Coster later commented, Trent was so focused in everything he did, when that guy waxed the floor, it looked great. Reznor eventually asked Coster for permission to record demos of his own songs for free during unused studio time. Coster agreed, so Trent began to work on his demo. Reznor was inspired by many industrial bands at the time, including Skinny Puppy and Ministry. He played the keyboards, drum machines, guitars, and samplers himself, The sequencing was done on a Macintosh Plus computer, and that's how he recorded his demo. Trent settled on the name Nine Inch Nails after it passed the two-week test. Many fans speculate on the significance of the name, and some feel it was a reference to the nine-inch spikes that were used to crucify Jesus. Reznor has never confirmed the meaning. While assembling the earliest Nine Inch Nails recordings, Trent was unable to find a band that could articulate his songs the way he wanted. So instead, being inspired by Prince, he played all the instruments himself. Reznor has kept this up on most of the band's studio recordings, though he has occasionally involved other musicians. Nine selections from the Right Track studio demos were unofficially released in 1988 as Purest Feeling. Purest Feeling is basically a demo album with a synth-pop vibe, similar to bands like Depeche Mode and Front 242, who were popular at the time. With the help of manager John Malum Jr., he sent Purest Feeling to various record labels. Reznor received contract offers from a few of the labels, but eventually signed with TVT Records, who were known for releasing television-themed song albums. The songs on Purest Feeling that made it to Pretty Hate Machine were heavily reworked, much to the dismay of the record label. While some of the synth-pop elements were retained, a much harder edge was applied to the tracks. The album was recorded in numerous studios, with Reznor collaborating with some of his most idolized producers, including Flood, Keith LeBlanc, Adrian Sherwood, and John Fryer. Much like his demo, Reznor refused to record the album with a conventional band. He did get production assistance from Chris Verena, who had collaborated with Trent for several years at this point, mostly in Cleveland club bands. The lyrics on the record express feelings of angst and betrayal by lovers, society, and religion. Upon turning in the completed record, Steve Godlieb, who is the head of TBT Records, called the album an abortion and told Reznor that he could have been good, but he probably just killed his career. The label had low expectations and did not expect the album to sell any more than 20,000 copies. Interestingly, 
many interviews given by Trent in the early days, expressed his desire to not blow up into a big band. One of those early quotes from Trent says, I want people to like it, but I'm not going to the extreme of putting out shitty, bland, radio-oriented music to get people to say, oh, I like that. If I can bend radio's ear to fit what I'm doing, great. If they won't bend, then fuck it, because I'm not going to pump out shit. Now, you also had a, a question regarding Trent's uh, evolution in terms of state of mind. I guess. Yes, um, the first song I heard was uh, Head Like a Hole when I was a freshman in college, and I was like, you know, who is that? And uh, as I, being an angry person myself, I kind of felt like I've related to your music for the last 18 years now. I've been a fan listening to your stuff. And I always thought to myself, if I had the chance to meet you and ask you, was, is why? What, like, what, you know, like, I know where it comes from, from within me, and what, like, what is it that drives you? What is it that makes you angry? Like, especially, like, uh, something I can never have, like, songs like that, like, was there a specific incident, or is it just a lifetime of pent up angst? You know, I, I don't have the specific answer as to why I'm what I am or what drives me necessarily, but I, I think part of it is, and now that I've got friends that grew up in big cities and stuff, you know, I couldn't wait to get out of Pennsylvania. Nothing against Pennsylvania, but I just, I felt like there was a world out there that you weren't allowed to get to because you were stuck in this cornfield with nothing to do. And a lot of that became a driving force to get out somehow, not be the guy working down the street at the gas station, you know, like, like, like I could see my destiny, you know. But when it came time to actually work on material and come up with ideas and, you know, when I realized I wasn't happy being the sideman in other people's bands, when it came time to find my own voice as a writer as to what I wanted to write about, you know, it started with a couple half ass attempts at sounding like The Clash or writing political lyrics that I didn't believe in because the bands I liked believed in those things. Um, I liked what Gang of Four was talking about, but... I, I, I don't have any personal experience in that, so it sounded like I was uh, a tourist. You know, I was just faking stuff on the first few kind of things I did, and then I found that I had been writing in a journal the whole time stuff that was kind of lyrics, but um, I couldn't ever show them to anybody because they were naked. You know, that was like I was going to go crazier. I had to write this stuff down, and when I finally got around to turning them into songs, that's what the first album came from, and. I think that's when I learned that, well, you can resonate with other people if what you're saying has truth to it. And I knew I meant what I said, and I was trying to do it in a way that had integrity. And it felt daring, and it was terrifying to let other people hear that because it was, it was, there was no character being created. It was just me. You know? Yeah, and it, and it felt like I'm not sure I want to show people, you know, that side because <laughs> it wasn't things I was proud of, you know, but it was things that really felt like it was driving me, and I had to get out somehow. And I think that's what really gave Nine Inch Nails its kind of impetus and, and, and made it communicate with other people, because it wasn't, it wasn't a postured fake thing. It wasn't calculated. Nor did I ever think it would really successfully take off in a commercial sense. And I'm not saying that from a humble point of view. It was more like it wasn't designed as a vehicle to get rich and famous. You know, It was just a way to, I have to get this out somehow. So let's dig into the tracks. The first track on the album is Head Like a Hole, which, if you know anything about Nine Inch Nails, you know that is an all-time Nine Inch Nails classic. It's the perfect opening song for the album. It's an immediate attention grabber and a total badass mix of electronic and guitar work. The lyrics are fantastic. I mean, there's no other way to put it than just the perfect introduction to what Nine Inch Nails is about. Track two on the album is Terrible Lie. This is my personal favorite track on the record. I love the lyrics and the feelings of doubt and betrayal just drip off the track. And this is just one of the moments on this album that leaves no doubt that Trent Reznor is a force to be reckoned with. I think that in terms of Nine Inch Nails live, this is one of my favorite tracks. The album version is a lot lighter than if you would look up online some of the live versions of the track. And I think that's just because Trent was just starting out and just trying to find the sound he wanted. Out of some of the other songs on the record, I think this one kind of sets the table for what to expect from Nine Inch Nails going forward. The third track on the album is Down In It. Now, this track is not one of my personal favorites on the record. It's probably one of the more poppiest tracks on the record. 
What's cool about this song, though, is they had produced a music video for it that was released in late 1989. And the end of the video had the implication that Trent Reznor's character in the video had fallen off a building and died in the street. And while they were filming, the directors at the time had used a video camera that was tied to a balloon. So there were ropes attached to prevent the balloon from floating away and escaping. But minutes after they started filming using this technique, the rope snapped and the balloons holding the camera rose into the atmosphere. And after traveling a good 200 miles, the camera landed in a farmer's field in Michigan. The FBI received the footage from the farmer and investigated it as if it was a person that committed suicide. The FBI perceived the tape as a snuff film and identified the person at the end to be Trent Reznor. The investigation ended when his manager demonstrated that Trent was in fact not dead and that the music video had nothing related to crime or Satanism. Funny enough, the story was covered by the news magazine show, Hard Copy. Reznor concluded that was the icing on the cake, getting on the worst TV show in America. The fourth track on the album was Sanctified. Now with this track, the bass has a hook that is just unreal. Um, definitely one of the sexiest songs on the record. Really shows the ability that Nine Inch Nails have to create a slick hook and also sound hard at the same time. Track five on the album, Something I Can Never Have. Now that song was used in the film Natural Born Killers. It's a hard-edged ballad that evokes feelings of loss and disdain. It's definitely an uh, all-time classic when it comes to the Nine Inch Nails catalog. It's been played live on numerous occasions, and it's really a cool track because it stands out and is very, very different from some of the other songs you'll hear on the record. The sixth track on the album is Kinda I Want To. Now this one is more synth-heavy, almost a new wave kind of feel. Um, it still has a hard edge to it, and the lyrics are some of the best on the album. But if I were to compare that with some of the tracks we already discussed... It's not my favorite, but it's definitely a good track. The next track on the album is Sin. I love the synthesizer work on this one. The song totally kicks ass. You can fight to it, you can fuck to it. Just like all great songs, it serves more than one purpose. Track 8, That's What I Get. This is really one of the best songs on the album. Um, it's angst captured in its truest form. Some of the vocal work, especially towards the end of the song, you can just tell the Trent's just going for it, that he just really means what the hell he's saying. That's more than I can say for a lot of bands. Uh, most of the time they just go through the motions, especially on the debut albums. They have trouble capturing their own kind of vibe, their own kind of sound, but Trent really pulls it off. The second to last track on the record is track nine, The Only Time. This is my least favorite song on the whole album. The lyrics are fairly good, but I just didn't really have this one stick with me. Over the years of being a huge Nine Inch Nails fan, the song I've listened to the least. Uh, I just never really find myself coming back to it. I think it's one of the more poppy songs on the album. I know some people that like it a lot, but it just never really resonated with me. And the final track on the album is track 10, Ring Finger. I'm really digging the intense vocal performance on this one, especially the drive in his voice of the last chorus. The song just, just hits me. You know, it's one of those tracks that is a great electronic rock song. Ring Finger features some moody bass parts and heavily distorted guitars. Lyrically, it really shines, and while some of the programming feels a little dated 30 years on, overall, it's a good track to close the album. So the aftermath of this album, it was released on October 20th, 1989, and Pretty Hate Machine was a commercial success. It peaked at number 75 on the Billboard 200, and the album gained popularity through word of mouth and developed an underground fan base. The record spent a whopping 115 weeks on the Billboard 200 chart. It spawned three singles, Down In It, Head Like a Hole, and Sin, which all received moderate airplay and was a big hit with college rock stations. Writer Chuck Palahniuk, author of Fight Club, said that Pretty Hate Machine was the album that seemed like the first honest piece of music he had ever heard and was a huge inspiration to Fight Club. Nine Inch Nails supported the album by performing on the Lollapalooza tour and also opened up for Guns N' Roses on a few dates. The album eventually garnered a platinum certification with 3 million albums sold. My final thoughts on this one is Reznor comes out swinging with a smaller scale but highly aggressive electronic rock album. While his sound at this point is far from full-fledged, it is undeniable that this is a musical genius finding his footing before totally stepping into his own. Pretty Hate Machine is a record that you can listen to and get more out of each time you hear it, and 30 years later, it still packs a big punch. 
I would give this an eight, eight and a half out of 10. If I would have heard this the day it came out, it would have easily been a 10 out of 10. Um, but I just think comparing this with some of the other albums that I'll review down the line, it's a great one, but it's not his best work. So until next time, signing off from the Launchpad.